this here. So we're okay though. You guys are fine. Also sell. Also sell. All right. I have. Uh, this is a little something. I'm not sure how I heard it, but this is uh, a little. Ian Fraser is a writer. He's Jewish, evidently. And he, he writes about human family situations using the rhetoric of uh, Leviticus. Laws concerning food and drink, household principles, lamentations of the father, of the beasts of the field and of the fishes of the sea and of all foods that are acceptable in my sight you may eat, but not in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> of the hoofed animals broiled or ground into burgers you may eat but not in the living room. <laughs> of the cloven hoof animal plain or with cheese you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the cereal grains, of the corn and the wheat and of the oats, and of all the cereals that are of bright color and unknown provenance you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the quiescently frozen dessert and of all frozen after meal treats you may eat, but absolutely not in the living room. <laughs> Of the juices and other beverages, yes, even of those in sippy cups, you may drink, but not in the living room. Neither may you carry such therein. Indeed, when you reach the place where the living room carpet begins, of any food or beverage there you may not eat, neither may you drink. But if you are sick and are lying down and watching something, then you may eat in the living room. <laughs> Laws at table. And if you are seated at, in your high chair, or in a chair such as a greater person might use, keep your legs and feet below you as they were. Neither raise up your knees nor place your feet upon the table, for that is an abomination to me. <laughs> yes, even when you have an interesting bandage to show, your feet upon the table are an abomination and worthy of rebuke. Drink your milk as it is given you. Neither use, it, use on it any utensils nor fork, nor knife, nor spoon, for that is not what they are for. If you will dip your blocks in the milk and lick it off, you will be sent away. <laughs> when you have drunk, let the empty cup then remain upon the table, and do not bite it upon this edge, and by your teeth hold it to your face, in order to make noises in it, sound like a duck, <laughs> for you will be sent away. When you chew your food, keep your mouth closed until you have swallowed, and do not open it to show your brother or your sister <laughs> what is within. I say to you, do not sow, even if your brother or your sister has done the same to you. <laughs> eat your food only. Do not eat that which is not food. Neither seize the table between your jaws, nor use the raiment of the table to wipe your lips. I say again to you, do not touch it, but leave it as it is. And though your stick of carrot does indeed resemble a marker, draw not with it upon the table, even in pretend. For we do not do that. And that is why. <laughs> that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. No, I and though the pieces of broccoli are very like small trees, do not stand them upright to make a forest. Because we do not do that. That is why. <laughs> Sit just as I have told you, and do not lean to one side or the other, nor slide down until you are nearly slid away. <laughs> Heed me, for if you are sit like that, your hair will go into the syrup. And now, behold, even as I have said, it has come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> There's more really on this, good. but this is all. Ian Fraser. F-A-F-R-A-Z-I-E-R. -E he's not Jewish himself. He surely understands the Jewish world. Maybe his spouse is Jewish. He's not himself. All right. There are certain books that we read that you just got to get through them. Okay? There's not too much beautiful, not too much lovely or deep and spiritual. I love Leviticus. I find numbers a bore. It's long. It's long, long, long. And notice, we weren't asked to read many chapters of no. it, like seven or eight. So we're, we're going to really hew to what you were asked to read and not do too much reading outside that. Um, I just find it just, it's just too much. In the Greek name, Numbers, comes for this book due to the two censuses 
uh, one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 26 that are found in the book. The Hebrew title from the first words are Bebed Bar, in the wilderness. And that's more kind of comprehensive. Indeed, choosing the title, one title or the other, gives a structure to the piece. If you think the censuses are the big point, call it numbers, well, that divides the book one way. If you see it in terms of in the wilderness, the life after they left Sinai, well, then it divides another way. And that's the outlook I'm going to bring. Chapters 1 through 10 are about forming a holy community around a holy God. Chapters 10, the last part, through chapter 21, are going to focus on the wilderness journey and internal threats. Internal threats. This is where God is constantly punishing them because they're, because they're resistant to God. Chapters 22 through 36, I titled Preparing for Canaan, or On the Plains of Moab. And this has to do with external threats. Okay? So, again, 1 through 10, forming a holy people around a holy God. 10 through 21, the wilderness journey facing internal threats. Preparing for Canaan, external threats, chapters 22 through 36. All right. Um, just, we're just going to skip the skip jump around here. Um, the first 10 chapters are really tedious, uh, in my mind, beginning with the, the, again, if you're a Jewish person, it's really important that you can find, you can trace your family lineage to this. So this is very important to them, but not so much for us. Um, the, it, it describes the numbering of the peoples and how they should camp with the tent of the meeting in the middle and then the various tribes around it in a, in a, built on a nice balanced square. Um, look at chapter 3, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of of every firstborn that opens the womb among the people of Israel, the Levites shall be mine. If you remember when they escaped from Egypt, the firstborn of Egypt was killed by the angel of death. And in chapter 13 of Exodus, it became, Moses said, every firstborn son belongs to God. And either you must buy it back from God, the animal, or you must break its neck. Person, but so there was this idea that the firstborn belongs to God. That was the price by which the Egyptians paid for Israel to be freed. So here in chapter three, God says the Levites are the firstborn, my first child. They're the ones that are, that that uh, I own, and and they're the ones who uh, they're mine. And now when they get to the promised land, they will not be given territory. The other tribes will, will divide up the land. The Levites are the only one who don't have a land because God is their portion. Okay? Chapter 6. This is, uh, this is the passages about the, about the, uh, the Nazarites. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine. You shall not drink any juice or grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. No raisin cookies for you. <laughs> All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine. Not even the seeds. All the days of his, lot, his vow of separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. So this idea of a Nazarite vow could be done for a period or for your life, a special dedication to the Lord. Notice women do it as well as men. Mm -hmm. Opening verses refer to that. Um, 
the, uh, one of your homework questions, I think, invites you to think about Nazarite characters in the New Testament. John the Baptist is an example of a Nazarite figure. In the Old Testament, Sa uh, Samson is an example. Okay? So, and, and Paul will take vows. We don't call them Nazarite vows, but he'll take a vow. And so the idea is you don't drink alcohol, let your hair grow. That's an outward sign that you're living uh, a life of extreme devotion to the Lord. Chapter 6, 22. This is one of the most famous, probably the most famous passage from Numbers. Um, one of the only ones that you're going to hear in church on a Sunday or holy day. It's read on New Year's Day. It's the blessing of Aaron. The Lord says to Moses, Say to Aaron and his sons, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say, The Lord, who is Yahweh, bless you and keep you. Yahweh, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So God tells Moses to tell Aaron, this is how the people should be blessed. So it's called the Aaronic, A-A-R, Aaronic blessing. Very, I mean, a lot of music is set, it sets it, and it's just, it's a kind of a common liturgical piece. Mine is kind of Bubba Gardner. Seriously? Oh, oh okay. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Scaring me there. I'm just scared. <laughs> Um, chapter 9. After, after the census, after these accounts, then it's time to go. Look at verse 20, the last verse. At the command of the Lord, they encamp, and at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. So this is, this is where begins the journeying, okay? So now they're, for the first time, they're leaving Sinai from Exodus 19 through Numbers 10. They have been camped out for about 13 months at Mount Sinai. And at this point, uh, they're going to move out. Verse 11 of chapter 10. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So then there's a description of the people as they move out. Verse 33. So they set out from the mount of the Lord, three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place. Verse 35. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee be before you. This phrase, this, I, this addressing the ark of the covenant as if it is God's house is going to become more and more frequent to the point where the Israelites see the, ta the, the ark of the covenant as a kind of a good luck charm. We'll see that in the books of Samuel, where they're fighting the Philistines, and uh, they think, well, let's bring the ark. There's no way we'll lose, because God will be fighting on our side. So they, they can be very kind of restricted and kind of magical about it. Uh, but this, there's a, one, of the, one of the psalms is, is a, kind of a, a, hymn of, a hymn of calling God to, to, uh, to fight on Israel's side, begins with that same verse about arise, O Lord. I think it's Psalm 68, I think. So now we begin, so now they're on the way. And what follows is a series of complaints. Now, remember, when they left Egypt on the way to Sinai, there was a short series of complaints. And every, it was, you know, we don't have water, we don't have food. Uh, you know, the Amalekites are out to get us. And every time they, they complained to God, God responded to their complaint. Okay? Now it's different. That is, God will respond, but he responds by punishment. Their murmuring and grumbling is seen as a lack of trust in the one that they had made this great covenant with. Okay? So from here on out, when they murmur, there will be a consequence. Right? 
So, as I said, this next section is where I'm going to focus on them on their journey and internal troubles. Their troubles are themselves. Huh? Okay, chapter 11. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord. And so the name of the Lord, the place was called Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Okay, so there's the first one. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, immediately follows the second one. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, We all that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But boy, that's a lot of bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> but now our strength is, stir is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. So again, they complain, and they, re they remember, oh, we had it good when we were slaves. Oh, to go back to Egypt. Verse 10, Moses heard the people weeping throughout the families, every man at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, why have you dwelt ill with your servant, with me? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people upon me? Did I conceive all this people? Here, Moses has his meltdown. <laughs> so back in Exodus, remember, Moses was the one, and it was God has the meltdown? Yeah. Here it's reversed. Huh? Did I bring these to, you know, these are your people, and why should I have to care for them? Um, where am I to get me to give them all this people? Well, then, then God again provides birds that come and, uh, and they feed, okay? Um, in fact, they have so much, and, and God kind of needs the meat as a punishment. He says, look at verse 19, you shall not eat one day or two days or five days or ten days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come forth out of Egypt? Okay? Um, I think chapter 12. Here is where there's a little bit of back talk from Miriam and Aaron. Okay? Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Now, Cush is Ethiopia, but Cushite is sometimes a nickname for the Midianites. And remember, Moses did marry a Midianite woman, uh, an Arab. Huh? So some people press the point that the complaint is that Moses married a black girl, Cush, Ethiopia. Others see it like, well, that's just another name for Midian. I don't know. Either way, you might see that in language, though. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, verse 2, they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken to us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all men that were on the face of the earth. I quoted this verse to you the very first time we met. You know, the tradition is that Moses is the author of all these books. Well, if you, he wrote that, then it can't, it's not true, is it? Huh? <laughs> the most meek of all the world, and he wrote that down. <laughs> um, so, so what does God do? God comes against Miriam and Aaron, makes Miriam become leprous. Okay? And it's like, oh my God, Lord. So you see, Moses' stock is rising. He's becoming more and more the figure. Uh, verse 9, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. He departed, and when the cloud had been removed from the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And, and, uh, and so Aaron like loses it. And in verse 13, Moses cries to the Lord, heal her, God, I beseech you. And so Miriam was made better. Verse 15, so Miriam was shut up outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam was brought in again. She only appears one more time, and then she dies. Okay? So Miriam's big, you know, Miriam may have been the girl who watched baby Moses 
the, the, the daughter, the, the sister who watched Moses as an infant in the little uh, uh, reed basket is never named. So the tradition is that that was Miriam. So you start out very strong. She's with the family. She's there in the, the sea, son of the sea. But in these later traditions, she's seen as a competitor to Moses and a bad girl. So please notice. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, chapter 13 and 14. This is the, what they call spying out the land. They are actually on the borders, the southern borders of the promised land. Okay? It's just like 14 months after they left Egypt. And they send, they send uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Actually, each tribe sends uh, a person to go along. And they scout out the land. And they spend 40 days. And they come back with wonderful stories of how rich the land. Uh, but they also acknowledge that there are people there. Look at verse 27 of chapter 13. They told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we see the descendants of Anak there, like the giant. Verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Verse 32. So they brought to the people of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Chapter 14. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and all the people of Israel murmured, there's that same verb that we saw in Exodus, against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, would that, here is the most complete complaint that you're going to hear of any of these, of these series. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Do you notice, would that we had died in this wilderness. God says, okay, you asked for it. <laughs> Why does the Lord bring us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly and congregation of the people. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, rent their clothes. So, the people, it's rebellion. Let's go back. Okay? Verse 10, second half. The glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? Verse 12. I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Does that sound at all familiar? <laughs> That's how we started today. That's from Exodus 32, okay, after the golden calf. Exactly what God said to Moses back then. And Moses responds similarly. He says, but then the Egyptians will hear of it, and that you did bring them up this people into, in your not might from among them. They will tell the inhabitants of this land that you did it on purpose. So Moses talks God down again, and uh, not to destroy them on start all over again. But in the end, the Lord says, well, then you will just stay here until this whole generation dies. This is how they spend 40 years in the wilderness. They had spent 13 or 14 months up to this point. And now they're going to sit here at a place called Kadesh Barnea, until that whole generation dies. This is important to know because next month, or for next month, you're going to read Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy it presents itself as a very long speech that Moses gives to the generation that's left as they're ready to enter into the promised land. 38 years later, he tells the children of those who had left the land about what God had done. Hands them new laws, and then, that, and then he takes his leave of them. 
Okay? So it's this incident that will call for the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? The, no sooner does God chastise them than they say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it right now. Now they get, they get an army, they go up, they get, they get obliterated by the Canaanites. Okay? So then they come back and then they spend the 38 years there. All right? Chapter 15, we won't even read. There is a, a, another pair of rebellions. Um, there is a rebellion led by a man named Korah and 250 others who duel with Aaron over priestly prerogative. I mean, you're not the only one who can offer sacrifice and incense, they say. That is meshed with a second complaint by a man named Dathan and Abiram, who refuse to follow Moses because they find him ineffective. Okay? Did you watch the original Ten Commandments film? <laughs> Dathan was Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> okay. In the end, the first group gets burned up by sacred fire, and the second group gets sucked into the earth. Okay? Uh, again, so again, again, every rebellion now is going to lead to uh, conflict. Okay? Um, enough of that. There's, this, is, this is where I get really tired. <laughs> We're not sure, if, I mean, depending on what, on what you read, there are nine of these or ten of these. It, it depends on how you slice them. Okay? Um, in chapter 18, 19, This section looks ahead to the crossing of the Jordan. Uh, this, this will lead eventually to the census, but they're get, they get themselves organized and you know various stuff like that. So we're in the last section now, chapter 22. I'm just kind of here. Hmm. Well, again, I skipped over some of the complaining bit. Let me back up. <laughs> Can't miss all. Uh, chapter 20. People of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Okay, so there's the last mention of that poor girl. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our brother died before the Lord. This is all very familiar. The word contended I introduced last time. The root word is rib, R-I-B, as in meriba, rib, okay? Meriba is going to appear again here. So verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting, fell on their faces. The glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said to Moses, take the rod, that's the same one that he used in front of Pharaoh, Assemble the people, you and Aaron, tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them, so you shall give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their cattle. And the Lord said to Moses, Because you did not believe in me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the people, Israel, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel contended with the Lord and he showed himself holy among them. Okay, a couple things going on here. There was a Meribah back in Exodus. Okay, any time they had this kind of contentious, murmuring, crabby, and then God gives them water, it becomes an example of Meribah. Now, next year, while is away, when we read Paul's letter to, letter to the Corinthians, he will talk about the rock that followed the Israelites through the desert. 
in his mind, in the mind of the Jewish rabbis who he learned from, this rock followed them wherever they went. So that it was like a calf, okay? So they could get water all the time. Now Paul will say that rock is Christ. Yeah. Yeah. They, he will take that and he will yeah. alter it for them. But so he's building it on some rabbinic lore that the rock of Exodus is the same rock here because the rock rolled along with them. Okay? But then Paul will change it by talking about Christ is the rock. And then also notice, here is where Moses is told he cannot lead the people into the promised land. Again, the rabbis debate, what did Moses do? What is so terrible? Is it that he called the people rebels? Is it that he raised his voice? Is it that he, he hit the rock twice? They Great debates, no clarity. But the point, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic and poignant moment that the leader cannot take the people home. He can only bring them so far, and he has to give up that joy, that celebration. Again, to be a servant that says, it's not about me, it's about you. Okay? So they circle round now. If you, do you have your atlases? Yeah. Pull them out, please. Somebody got a map? Mine? What? Say the first word? Seven. Seventy-eight, boys and girls. It's seven, page 78. Oh, the map. The setting of the Exodus and wilderness traditions. Okay, you got your maps, boys and girls? Okay, so you see the little red line? The little red line is, is the, there. They went down to Sinai at the bottom of that triangle, then they come up, okay, and then um, Kadesh Barnea is up north, directly up north, before the green starts, okay, that's where they spend 38 years, okay, now we're, yeah, that, they're close, right on the edge, but now begins the journey to the promised land, and instead of going north, they go south, east, to Etzion Geber, and they cross over, and then they come up on the right side of the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, and so they, they pass the kingdoms of Moab and Edom on their way to cross back over. Okay? So keep, keep that in mind as we read about Balaam and Balak. If you're murmuring, what's going on out there? <laughs> We don't, uh, they go just north of the Salt Sea, just right above it. It'll say Jericho, maybe? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's the spot where it's remembered. Okay, are we clear? No. I wish... Remember, in the middle section, Jesus is not happy with you. Remember? I, Jesus, I see you and Jesus sees you. Okay, so anyway, the, in the middle section, all the resistance was internal. At this leg, the, journal, the, the resistance is external. And this is where the story of, of um, well, there's one more internal one that, that we have to read because it comes up in the liturgy. Chapter 20. Go 
was 21. 21, sorry. 21 verse 4, the last line. The people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water. We loathe this worthless food. <laughs> then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Okay, it's, a, it's the ninth time that they murmur and complain. Be tough. And it's very strange in that the solution God offers them does what? Breaks the commandment about making the objects of living things. Again, God's the lawgiver. God can break the law. Okay? And the serpent, it's not just magic looking at the serpent. The implication is that you have to believe that God, who told you to do this, will heal you. Right? So when the people complain, God lets them, lets, leaves them be, lets the seraph, serpents attack them. They cry out. God provides a visual way by looking at the serpent, that looking at the emblem of their rebellion is what leads to healing. This is important because in the New Testament, in the church fathers, and but in the New Testament, this image of the serpent on the pole, Jesus in John's gospel will use to talk about himself. Just as Moses in the desert raised the serpent on the pole, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Okay? And anyone who see who see who puts his faith in him will have life in him. Okay? So the, um, if, you have, if you ever get to Jordan, if you go to Moab, where this is all remembered, Mount, Mount Moab, they have a, again, it's a Christian shrine there, a church, and they've got a cross with a serpent that's curled around it as an emblem of Jesus. So you might see that in art. Now, don't think of the, the serpent in the, in the garden, but you might see the serpent on the pole or the serpent on the cross as an emblem of Jesus. <laughs> In Christ, on the cross, we see the fullness of man's inhumanity to man. The cross, the story of the death of Jesus, shows the height. I mean, read the narrative of the passion story. It shows us at our worst. There's lying and deception and cruelty and, and, and betrayal and all of that is there. And by, in John's gospel, by embracing that and viewing that, life is made so while it's a quaint story, a little odd story, it looms large in the New Testament, particularly the Gospel of John. Now, finally, chapter 22 to the end, preparing for Canaan and the plains of Moab. This section looks ahead to crossing of the Jordan. In chapter 26, there's the new census. In chapters 28 and 29, there's instructions with a calendar. In 27, 32, 34, 36, there is laws about inheritance. In chapter 35, there's the establishment of, law, of the cities of refuge. I said, I think last time, if you accidentally killed somebody, um, again, there was still the desire for blood, you know, eye for an eye. But if you could run away and get to one of the cities of refuge and hold as long as you held the horns of the altar, you were not to be touched. It was the law of sanctuary. Okay? So there are cities that are named for where those shrines can be kept. That's, that's kind of the conclusion. The big event, though, the big narrative that lingers large again in the New Testament is the story of Balaam. Chapter 22. Balak, not to be confused, is king of Moab. Okay, look at your map. Can you see Moab? It would be to the right of the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. 
Okay? So as the, this crowd of, of refugees from Egypt are making their way around them and then up to the, to the east, the king of Moab is worried and he <laughs> wants to hire a man who can curse the, this people and therefore get, get them off their back. And the man he hires is named Balaam. Okay? Verse 7 of chapter 22. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. He said, Lodge here this night, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. Notice, as the Lord, as Yahweh speaks to me. So in the narrative, Balaam, in one sense, he is a worshiper of another deity, but he also still recognizes Yahweh in some capacity. Okay? And uh, God first tells him that you shouldn't go. And so, and, and, and Balaam relays that. Uh, Balak sends more, more messengers, more money, and asks again. And uh, verse 18, Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. And then verse 20, And God came to Balaam at night and said, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them. But only what I bid you, then shall you do. So after twice saying no, Yahweh says, now, go. And so he does. This is the famous passage where Balaam gets on his donkey and uh, is on his way. But it, this is a very odd story. Lots of little old elements. Verse 22, God's anger was kindled because he went. Now back in verse 20, it was God who told him to go. But in 22, God doesn't want him to go. The story would flow more easily if God's telling him to go got cut out, but we can't do that. We can deal with it, okay? Just point it out to you. So the angel of the Lord stands in the way, and the donkey can see this and doesn't want to go. He sees the angel with a sword. He's going to threaten the one who's riding him and maybe the donkey himself. And Balaam beats the donkey, uh, and the donkey, the donkey won't go, and it just rubs against the wall. And um, verse 26, Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right or the left. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the ass with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the ass, because you have made sport of me. Doesn't stop and say, wow. Don't <laughs> stop and say, <laughs> no. He says, he answers, because you made sport of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the ass said, I am not your ass, upon which you have ridden all your life long. Am I not your ass, which I have ridden all your life long this day? Was I ever accustomed to do so to you? And he said, no. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell on, the, on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your ass these three times? Behold, I have come forth to withstand you, because your way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have slain you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel, I have sinned. I did not know that you did stand in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will go back again. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, No, go with the man. <laughs> this, this, is, this is like... <laughs> but, but only the word which I bid you, then shall you speak. So Balaam went on with 